So it's a pleasure to welcome you, Marilyn, to the uh, uh, Coronavirus Multispecies Reading Group. You've given us a lovely paper to help us think about uh, mutualistic microbial symbionts um, and viruses. You know, there's, there's a long history in the humanities and the social sciences of, of engaging with bacteria as, um, you know, components of our microbiome, as, as things that are kind of integral to what it means to be human. And you're, um, with this paper, offer, offering us a whole suite of resources to not only think about um, viruses, like I guess it's called the, the good boy virus is, is one that um, uh, kind of uh, uh, impacts HIV pathogenesis, but also a, a variety of other viral infections um, that might be mutualistic or, or antagonistic. Um, so, so I was hoping that you might kind of give us give us more background and unravel some of these very rich examples. Um, one, one of the most imaginative ones is the viral infection that results in the development of winged aphids. Um, so maybe if, yeah. if, if you could talk about that one in particular or, or any of the conceptual issues related to kind of antagonism and, and mutualism. And sure. this yeah, version. so that's, that is a really interesting um, story. And that's what we would call um, conditional mutualism. So the, it's a denzovirus that infects uh, the rosy apple aphid. And when the virus is, when the aphid is infected with the virus, it grows wings. It, otherwise it doesn't have wings. So, you know, aphids can come in winged or not. And there's some very technical terms for that, which I never remember. So either winged or not winged. Um, and so, so they have to have the, they have to have the virus. I think they have to acquire it, I think in the nymph stage. And then as they develop, they'll grow wings. It's, the virus is a little bit of a disadvantage for the aphid in that it, they're a little smaller when they have that virus. Um, and then they also don't reproduce quite as well. But they also, of course, if they don't have the virus, they can't move. So they are stuck wherever they're born and that's it. So, um, it seems like it, this isn't really fully demonstrated, but it seems like the plant is actually the vector for the virus. So you can imagine the winged aphid, it's flying around, it lands on a plant. And as it starts to feed, it deposits the virus in the plant tissue. Then it has offspring. The virus is not vertically transmitted. So, so the offspring um, don't have wings and they just are reproducing on this plant and the plant starts to get really crowded. And since there's some virus in the plant tissue, it's not reproducing in the, that, that tissue, but it's there. Eventually one of the nymphs will pick up the virus and grow wings and then it can fly off and start a new colony. So, so it's a condition of crowding when, when the plant gets too crowded, the odds of somebody picking up the virus is really increased and then it lets it move to a new plant. Could, could you walk me through that crowding logic a little bit more? So if the plant is the one transmitting the virus, like how, how does the aphid cra crowding relate to the, well, you know, the viral so shedding? Or? There seems to be um, not very much virus in the plant, right? The virus doesn't reproduce in the plant, it just gets deposited there. And so it probably has to be fairly crowded before what an aphid by chance picks it up. I mean, it's possible that the very first offspring could pick it up, but the odds get greater as the plant gets more crowded because there's not a lot of virus there. So hmm. that's the crowding thing. And, it, and then of course, if, it is, if the plant is really crowded, then it, if nobody can move, then they just, the whole colony will eventually collapse and die out. Super interesting. Um, and, and then, you know, jumping straight to humans and, and, you know, like usual, if anyone else has questions, feel free to unmute yourself, type them in the chat, just jump right in. Um, but related to humans, could, could you say more? Uh, apparently, there's been some clinical studies uh, done related to um, slower HIV uh, disease progression after being uh, infected with GB, uh, GBVC uh, is the technical name. It's, I guess a yeah. type of hepatitis virus. It is. Um, I, honestly, I, that's not a virus I have very much expertise on, but, but yes, there is um, clearly slower development of AIDS, AIDS when people are infected with HIV, if they have this, this hepatitis, it used to be called hepatitis G. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the International Committee for the Taxonomy of Viruses, but they are just passionate about renaming viruses constantly now. So. <laughs> 
if you try to look up a virus on their website, usually you can't find it because they've given it a new name and their search engine is not very user friendly. So you have to have the exact name to find it. But at any rate, so honestly, I don't even know what its current official name is, but it used to be hepatitis G virus. And then there are a couple of other um, hepatitis viruses also that are just benign. They never, they've never caused any disease that we know of. And this is one of those. So yes, if you have that virus and then you acquire HIV, then it really slows the progression of, of the disease. So definitely a mutualistic virus. Super interesting. And part of this article is exploring kind of the context that um, that kind of might bring out either uh, mutualistic or antagonistic uh, symbiogenesis. Could you talk about that a little bit about how um, some of these these viruses interact not only with the host, but, you know, uh, conditions of drought and, um, uh, you know, things that, that cause cause the plant to go into different physiological states. Right. So. Um... The drought, the drought thing is quite interesting and has been um, validated in quite a lot of different systems now. So this was an, basically an accident in the lab um, that in my lab, one of my postdocs, I think just forgot to water her plants. I'm actually not sure the whole background, but she came to me, she was so excited and she showed me that her control plants were all dying, but the ones with virus were doing a lot better. And she said, I would have never thought of it if you didn't always talk about how viruses might be beneficial. So um, that's how that study got done. And we just looked at all the viruses we happened to have in the lab at the time and several different plants. And in every case, the viruses, and these were all plus strand RNA viruses, most common type of viruses in plants. So they all conferred drought tolerance. Um, so all, all of the infected plants would have a delay in, in the symptoms of drought and also death. So once there's tip the shoot of the plant wilts, usually there's no coming back. So if you can delay that, um, it's a significant difference for the plant. And in, in terms of agriculture, um, nobody has applied this yet, but uh, I think that, you know, if you're a farmer and you're waiting for it to rain, a few days could make the difference of whether you have a crop or not. So it could be a really a significant help. This has been seen now in, in somewhat like wild grasslands where virus infection converts drought tolerance. So again, it's a conditional mutualism. In all the cases we looked at, the viruses were pathogens, but if there was drought, then they became beneficial. So it's a, it starts as an antagonist and, just, and then it just depends on the conditions, whether it's an antagonist or mutualist. And those kind of relationships in symbiosis are are probably pretty common actually, this sort of switch from one, from antagonism to mutualism. And, and are you at the point where you're able to talk about kind of molecular pathways? Like are, are these these viruses loading? So, so Forrest, uh, I forget how long ago, maybe about a year ago was telling us about um, some, some genes that cyanobacteria can acquire that enhance the efficiency of, of foraging for things like phosphorus. Is it, is it a similar kind of story with, with the plants? Um, we don't know so much about the mechanisms in plants. In our lab, we looked at, um, we looked at very obvious things like um, osmotic protection components like proline and sugar content is higher. And that's actually been known for plant viruses for a long time that all, most acute plant viruses, um, plants have higher sugar content. That can be an osmoprotectant as well. Um, but we, we did a little bit of work with that, but not a whole lot. Um, we did some proteomics analysis of the infected and uninfected plants. Um, I think there, I, re, I saw recently somebody is working on a study to look at transcriptome analysis of drought tolerant plants from virus infection, but I don't know that any really good details have been published. And the, to be honest with you, um, I never really cared about the mechanisms very much. So I was always much more interested in the whole ecology of the systems. And, and I do get asked about mechanisms a lot and I usually just say, I don't really care. But um, <laughs> I said that once at a, a seminar I gave at a university and one of the younger faculty members said, yeah, you can get away with saying that, but I could never get away with saying that. <laughs> so everybody wants to know what's the mechanism, but honestly, um, 
We haven't done a whole lot of work on mechanisms in any of these systems in my lab. Some other people have. I feel like my role in, has always been to start something new and let somebody else carry on later. So, <laughs> so I know there are people working on, on like transcriptome analyses, at least of the mechanisms, but not me. And go ahead, Rachel. Um, so, uh, you know, on the, the first page of your article, you talk about, you know, pathogens uh, as, as vital partners of eukaryotic life. And then you go on to talk about, you know, that we recognize all life as symbiotic. And you were just talking before we hit record about the last chapter of your forthcoming book on pandemics. And I'm just curious, how are you um, talking about this uh, in your forthcoming work then in the context of, of pandemics, you know, maybe you can say a little bit more about taking these concepts and, and applying them to, um, to, to pandemic moments and in, sure. in plant world. Yeah. So first of all, I should say that symbiosis does not mean beneficial or mutualistic. And a lot of people get that confused. A symbiotic relationship is just an intimate relationship between two very dissimilar entities. So all viruses by that definition are symbionts, but they can be pathogens or, or not. Um, and, and really the thinking about pandemics or even disease in general caused by viruses is that it's generally a virus that's in the wrong place. So if you have a virus that has a long relationship with its host, um, it probably isn't gonna cause disease. That, you know, the virus will have evolved to be um, pretty neutral in that host. But if it jumps into a different species, then, then there's just like all hell breaks loose, we could say. Can I say that on? Um, <laughs> you know, because the, there is just no relationship there. They're establishing a new relationship. And so the virus doesn't set out to be a pathogen. It's just happenstance. It's accidentally disrupting something important in the host. Um, and in fact, it's often the immune system that is responsible for pathology. And as far as I know, that's true in both animal, human, and plant viruses. Um, in plants, the immune system of plants, the, the adaptive immune system is RNA silencing. So the plants, um, when they're infected with a virus, they make these small RNAs that have sequence identity to the virus. And then those trigger this whole pathway that chops the virus up. Well, a lot of times those small RNAs, they're only like 21, 22 nucleotides long, and they will just by happenstance also match a plant gene. And so then that plant gene gets chopped up too. So it's the overactive immune system that of the plant. The same is true in almost all pathology in, in uh, human viruses. Like they, they have, um, you know, the, the, the innate immune system is really, can really make you sick. You know, if you ever talk to anybody had, that had interferon treatment for something, they get really, really sick from that. Um, so it's the, all, the whole thing, inflammation, fever, that's all your immune system trying to react to protect you. So it's the trade-off, you know, making you a little sick to get rid of the virus, that's probably fine. But a lot of the disease is actually the host response to the virus. So in general, I think of pandemics like the coronavirus is a great example because it's a bat virus that got into humans by accident. And it probably, and, and that also makes it really hard to find the origin. The bats that have that virus are probably not sick at all. They don't have any, they wouldn't have any indication that they have the virus. So, you know, you can't go look for sick bats and try to find it, but it's in the wrong host a new novel host, they're not adapted to each other. And so it makes the human host very ill. Um, and the prediction is also that it will become less virulent over time because in fact, it's not really an advantage of, for the virus to make its host very sick. Um, if it's too sick, you know, if the, if the host dies, the virus dies right along with it. And it also is, if the host is just sick enough to stay home and never go out, um, the virus isn't going to get passed on to any other host. So, you know, the, there's like a, hopefully a middle ground where the virus make, does whatever it does that by happenstance might make you sick, but it's not 
a driving force in the evolution of the virus to be a pathogen. Just one kind of editorial comment. So we've got I've got Lim Fa Wang um, visiting in a couple of weeks, and um, you know one of the guys who came up with the original uh, SARS uh, uh, bat reservoir hypothesis, and he's he's not convinced that SARS CoV two um, is necessarily a, a bat story, or at least exclusively a bat story. Um, so I, I think we can watch that space to see. Well, that's um, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just said that because oh, there's been that assumption, but. Whatever its original host is, it's not making that host sick. Yep. So that's the, that's why it's very tricky to find the origins of pandemics. That's one of the most difficult parts. Not to mention recombination and uh, yeah, all that undersampling other of the virus sphere and all those it, other things. The virus has evolved so much by this time anyway. In a couple of years, that's a long, long time for an RNA virus to evolve, even a coronavirus. So I was also interested, you, you touch on um, endogenous retroviruses in here, and um, I've been doing a little reading in that literature and um, would just love to hear, um, you know, more like, so is, I know that they're pretty widespread in mammals, but, you know, primates seem to have a lot of them. Um, is this an idiosyncratic, uh, you know, mammal primate story, or is it a quite a big story about uh, life on earth? It's pretty broad. I mean, even um, the element retro elements are found even in fungi, um, you know, which are remnants of probably previous retroviruses. But fungi don't actually have any current infectious retroviruses, but they have signs in their genomes that they were there once. Plants have um, plants currently have can be infected with retroviruses, which are related to retroviruses. They don't usually have to integrate into the genome to replicate, but they still are found in genomes. And, um, but yeah, among the animals, they're, they're very ubiquitous. 8% um, of our genome is retrovirus. And uh, I, I think it's actually a lot more. That's only, you know, there's a lot more elements that are probably of retroviral origin as well. And yeah, so some of those are functional and you, there's quite a, there are quite a lot of them of endogenous retroviruses where you can find transcripts of them. So they're actually active. They're making something. Um, we don't often don't know what they do, but of course the, the one that makes sensitin is the most um, famous, I suppose, the most interesting in a way. Uh, so, you know, this is a, re a retrovirus where the envelope gene of the retrovirus has evolved in all placental mammals have this um, to produce the placenta. So sensitin is a gene that causes the fusion of the membranes of um, cells in the placenta. That's basically how the placenta forms. And that's, it's the same thing that they do as an envelope in a retrovirus. They, they cause cell fusion like that, but in the, it happened to have been what's required for a placental mammals. And I, there are several different retroviruses in different lineages of mammals that do this. And it's not really clear whether placental mammals evolved multiple times or whether the virus just got displaced by another one in, in the evolutionary lineage. So, you know, there is a retrovirus, an endogenous retrovirus that's in the process of endogenous, endogenization in koalas. Um, you may know about this. Um, it's a very interesting story. It's been happening over the last hundred years or so. And this is the only example I know of where a virus is actually in the process of endogenization. I mean, most of these are just there in the genome when we find them. Um, and I should also clarify that to become endogenized, it has to infect the germline cells. Otherwise, I mean, retroviruses always integrate into the genome of the cell they're infecting. But if it's not a germline cell, we would never see it again. But in koalas, um, there is a island, I wanna say it's Kangaroo Island, but I might, that might not be the right name. But anyway, there, the, the koalas on that island were, were separated about a hundred years ago from the mainland population. And none of them have the endogenous retrovirus. Whereas the ones on the mainland, um, most, not all, but many of them have it, but it's, an, it's integrated in all kinds of different places. So uh, I don't know, I said maybe the, maybe they're gonna become placental mammals 
<laughs> koalas, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, um, that's the only, as far as I know, that's the only known example of that process happening as in real time now. Super interesting. And um, so my last book was on on uh, uh, CRISPR. Uh, Forrest, good to see you. Bye. Bye, <laughs> um, Forrest. Um, so my last book was on CRISPR, and a, a lot of the concern there is about, you know, whether or not the CRISPR can uh, impact the germline cells, you know, if you're doing a, a somatic uh, a gene therapy, um, you know, what, what's the risk of, of that? So how, how much is known, um, you know, about, um, you know, viruses in, infecting the germline? Is, is that is that been studied to your knowledge? Um, well, I would say pretty much anybody that studies endogenous retroviruses have, has looked at that. But um, other than if you look at any, pretty much any life form that I know of, at least eukaryotic life, well, yeah, bacteria too, they all have pieces of virus integrated into the genomes all over the place. And obviously those have to be germline to be carried on. But the actual process of infecting Germline cells, I don't know what that, there's not very much known about that. Um, CRISPR, I just want to give a little plug for the real CRISPR rather than this tool <laughs> that everybody talks about. The yeah. real, real CRISPR, CRISPR is the adaptive immune system of bacteria. And I don't know, when I was in college, they, everybody said bacteria don't have an immune system, which is, of course, we always get so arrogant about things, don't we? <laughs> but anyway, CRISPR is actually the adaptive immune system of bacteria and archaea. Um, and it has been utilized now as a tool to, to modify genomes. But I, I don't know whether, I mean, I do think it's still risky what people are doing. I, I don't, I think we need more research and more understanding before we start adding genes to the human genome. I'm not quite ready to go there myself. But. <laughs> I mean, this is kind of like just going on a little bit of a flight of science fiction fantasy here, but, um, you know, in the same way, well, and maybe I'll, I'll preface this by talking about like the actual clinical trials that I was focusing on. So, you know, I found that um, CRISPR was in some cases doing the least interesting part of the clinical experiment. So they would use the CRISPR to delete a receptor, um, a, a CD4 positive T cells, um, making it uh, kind of more more lethal. But then they were using a lentivirus to, to load um, uh, another receptor, a, a chimeric antigen receptor, on, onto the onto the cell. Um, and and I, I guess um, you know, departing from that uh, sort of somatic gene therapy. I'm wondering if, if people are, are at all starting to talk about lentivirus therapies targeting the germline or, or things like that. I have not heard of anybody planning that kind of work, but on, it's really outside of my area where I can keep, I can't keep up with everything. So it's an area <laughs> yeah. I haven't really spent a lot of time thinking about. Certainly virus, viral therapy has been discussed and used. When I was in graduate school, they talked about using um, probably adenovirus or something as a therapy for cancer treatment. And that was, you know, I hate to say how long ago that was, but anyway, in the 19, early 1980s, they were already then talking about it. Um, and it's been used, it's been tried off and on as, you know, a way to get either to suppress a cell like a cancer cell or to, to treat thing, genetic diseases like um, like sickle cell anemia, for example, things or beta thalassemia. So I, I imagine that, I mean, that's the problem when you do it in the germline, it's forever. So you really want to do that. I don't know. I mean, if you treat somatic cells with something, then at least it's not passed to the next generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a big, there's a big leap there. I think ethical leap there between gene therapy on somatic cells and gene therapy on germline cells. Yeah, um, the, some, something I've, I could talk endlessly about, I, I wrote a book about it, but I'd love to get back to your to your paper. Um, so part of what you're talking about is um, like the holobiont concept. And, and I was wondering if you could just kind of un, unravel that a little bit. And, you know, how, how do viruses connect one organism with another organism? and how do you draw boundaries around a holobiont? 
Yeah, and those are kind of squishy boundaries, I would say. Um, you know, <laughs> we think of like, the whole Obaya is technically the the uh, an, an organism and everything that lives in and on it. But on the other hand, you could almost think of the whole planet as the whole Obaya in a sense too, because everything interacts with everything else. And I, I think that the concept of the individual, we, we use the concept of the individual, but there really are no individuals. Other than perhaps a, you could maybe have an individual, you know, of, of a E. coli that you might clone, or you might put on a Petri dish, spread it um, with the low enough copy number that you get co individual colonies and those could be considered an individual maybe, but you know, basically nothing on the earth is, is just living by itself on its own. So the whole concept of holobiont means everything that's involved. We are full of not only our own viruses, but the human virome also consists of a lot of bacterial viruses. And Boris could have talked about some of that because he's done some really cool stuff for that. But, you know, like one of the ideas is that the, the phage that our, um, coming from our own gut bacteria, maybe standing at the ready at the entry points, the mucous membranes to attack any, any other bacterial invaders that could be pathogen. So they may actually be part of our immune system as well, those, those viruses that are coming from our, our, um, our friendly bacteria. Yeah, Jer Jeremy Barr has has shared some some of his. He's he's a, a former postdoc from Forrest's lab, who's yeah. now here in Melbourne, and has shared some really interesting stuff with us on on that. Um, and and I guess just conceptually, so I, I so you know we're we're kind of coming from the um, you know humanities, social sciences, trying to think about um, what we call multi species assemblages, and you know an, an assemblage in our theory is kind of a contingent association of um, either different kinds of organisms, but you know we also talk about assemblages that might involve machines or infrastructures or, or that right. kind of thing. Um, so, so I guess I mean, am, am I kind of right in kind of translating the whole abiant here as maybe a contingent assemblage amongst organisms that stay stay connected somehow, either through the exchange yeah. of viruses or, um, yeah, through viruses, through their bacteria, through everything they have, basically. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think that, you know, it's something that it's just a new way of thinking in a way, but it's interesting how much we share our members of our whole lobiant when we come in contact with other people. And obviously, since coronavirus has been around, we know how easily we can share our viruses just by breathing the same air. Um, mm -hmm. But also, you know, I, I wonder if the handshake is, is going to disappear now. Um, but, you know, you can share a lot of microbes by, by handshakes. And, you know, so not just airborne, but just physical contact of any sort. And I guess maybe we have to think about that in terms of sharing our, our um, microbiome too. One of the other concepts that jumps out is is uh, a symbiogenesis um, that, that you uh, gloss as the fusion of entities to create a new entity. Um, mm -hmm. Like, can you talk about time scales here? And can you talk about, um, you know, I, I, I would imagine, you know, in some ways, this is maybe the theory of evolution, like, you know, like Margulis have talked about, you know, these chloroplasts and mitochondrial stories, but to okay. me, this might seem to be a bigger part of the evolutionary story than we're taught in, in high school. Absolutely. I think that, well, and you know, Darwin never <laughs> even heard of symbiosis or it was not a concept that was really, it, it was towards the end of, I mean, it was in the late 1800s that, that the discovery of like and being a symbiont of two, two um, dissimilar entities. Let's see, my dad used to say a fungus fungi, but that's not, that's sort of like one step before symbiogenesis. So symbiogenesis, are you still hearing me? Because I'm getting a little 
unstable internet message. Yeah, right? there, we, we missed about 30 seconds. So if you could rewind and, and do okay. that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know where you, where I fell out, but at any rate, um, yeah. So Darwin did not consider symbiosis in, uh, in his writing. He didn't, it was not a concept that was really described yet at that time. That came later um, and it was of course about lichen initially, but then later other things like the rhizobium in plant roots, they're symbiotic. But to become symbiogenesis really does require a fusion and um, viruses, you know, our genome, those, that 8% of our genome that's retrovirus, that's all symbiogenesis. That's fusion between our genome and a viral genome. And not only that, but there are tons of other viruses in our genomes too. They're not as abundant, but um, know about them going anywhere near this, they're still found in the genome. So, so the whole process of symbiogenesis with viruses has probably been going on, yeah, since some, and maybe that's really what we are. I sometimes think we are just one big fused amalgam of viruses. Like, are, <laughs> if you want to think of viruses first as the original life form, um, I would be, I'm sure that Eugene Kunin would disagree with me, but that's okay. Um, I do, you know, it's an idea. I think, I think Luis Villarreal actually first suggested that we are just a big, our genome. We lost you again, Marilyn. I'm sorry. I, I, <laughs> we could we could try killing the video maybe, and just doing. Yeah, maybe try without audio. video. Um, okay, I could turn off the video. Yeah. So you gave us a name of uh, it didn't quite come through. Someone who came up with the idea that uh, viruses are. Um, that we're all just kind of uh, big viruses amalgamated? We're a coalescence of, our, yeah, that came from Luis um, Villarreal. And he wrote a book about it. I think it's called Viruses and the Origin of Life. Uh -huh. So um, Luis is, I've known my whole career actually. He was on my PhD committee when I was a young person, but right. um, yeah, the book has got a lot of interesting ideas in it. I will say it's a little heavy reading, but <laughs> um, yeah. So, so that that's something I, I find that idea very appealing. That we're just you know the viruses came first and they began to fuse and fuse and fuse and make larger and larger genomes, and eventually evolved into whatever bacteria and so on. Yeah. It's a it's a compelling view, um, and how how does that sit with mainstream vi well not to say that this isn't mainstream virology but like you know the dominant trend in virology seems to be focusing on you know so called pathogens the things that oh, either yeah. make humans or livestock or crop animals sick um, so so how does that idea that we are viral you know, I gave it. Oh, I think people would think it's kind of a very fringy idea, most. But, but on the other hand, I have mentioned it before, and, and you, you know, people nod their heads about it. Um, I've never been a very uh, mainstream thinker, I guess. So, that, <laughs> that people are used to my crazy ideas by now. But I, you know, even the fact that viruses are beneficial at all is it took a little work even on virologists. So in, I think it was 2010, so more than a decade ago now, I gave a talk at the um, American Society for Virology meeting, which is the largest virology meeting in the world. And I talked about mutualistic viruses. And so there are like 1500 people or so in the audience. And I mean, people came up to me afterwards and just said, I never thought of anything like that. And I said, you've been studying viruses your whole career and it never occurred to you that they could be beneficial. I mean, but yeah, I think a lot of people, it, people are moving in that direction and there've been some um, really kind of prominent people have pushed the idea a bit more. Like the, um, when Lynn Enquist was the 
president of the American Society for Microbiology. He had a symposium on beneficial viruses. So, you know, it's becoming more acceptable, I guess, to talk about it that way, but people still focus on the, on the pathogens for sure. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I don't know, There's met, um, maybe there are several reasons for that. For one thing, people like bad news better than good news. And <laughs> recently there was somebody, I saw a, a, something in like either the little science or the nature email newsletters I get that said that, that it's an it, evolutionary advantage for us to pay more attention to bad news because I think how they put it was, if, a, if you think, a tiger is chasing you and you run away from it. That's not so bad. I mean, if there's no tiger, okay, you haven't lost much. But if you don't think a tiger is chasing you and there really is a tiger, you know, then you're going to be dead. So better to err on the side of bad news. <laughs> yeah. Um, zeroing back in on some of these really rich examples that you've offered us uh, about the, the mutualistic relationships here, I, I was wondering if you could just unravel a, a few of them. So you, you talk about the different wasp parasites. I'm most familiar with the ichneumoid wasps, um, I guess also braconid wasps. And yeah. um, can, can you tell that story and how viral genes um, relate to, uh, I guess it's... Um, it's a complicated story, so I'll, I'll let you tell it. <laughs> yeah, and I would say, I kind of consider that story to be a, an example of symbiogenesis. Um, hmm. So those, the Bracanids, there are about 30,000 species of Bracanids and it's thought they each have their own virus. So there's really a lot of those viruses in the, and the other, the ichneumid wasps also have their own. Um, I know there's been some recent updates in that work, but but anyway, the whole, the basic idea is that these are parasitic wasps. They lay their, their eggs, usually in lepidopteran caterpillars, and then the egg develops in the caterpillar. It, it hatches in it, and the larva eat the caterpillar. Basically, they feed off of it. Um, and the only way that can happen is if the immune system of the caterpillar is suppressed. Otherwise, it would expel the egg. And that happens because genes from the wasp are actually par packaged in the viral particle. So when the, when the wasp lays its eggs in the caterpillar, it deposits these viruses, the polydin, they're called polydinoviruses because they have many DNA segments. So they deposit the virus along with the egg and then the virus doesn't even have any wasp genes in it, it or sorry, viral genes in it. It only has wasp genes and it, those get expressed and suppress the immune system of the caterpillar. The viral genes like for replication and packaging and all that are actually found in the wasp genome. So they're not actually in the virus. So it's an old, old relationship and definitely I would call it an example of symbiogenesis. <laughs> It's not a, a, a neat, uh, uh, you know, kumbaya, uh, everyone gets along story of symbiogenesis. It's a kind of monstrous one, but it's a, a, a delightfully grotesque, monstrous story. Well, it's a wonderful thing for the wasp, who is the <laughs> right. host of the so you, uh, This is often true. You know, there are lots of examples of viruses that are beneficial for their host, but people still won't accept that they're mutualist because the host is so good for for us right like <laughs> there are a number of plant um, fungi that are pathogenic in plants and viruses suppress their pathogenicity so like um, the most famous one is chestnut blight chestnut blight mm. is caused by a fungus if the fungus is infected with the virus it no longer kills chestnut trees mm. um, but it's not that isn't really a beneficial virus for the fungus it's a beneficial right. virus for the plant, even though it's a fungal virus. On the other hand, um, white nose syndrome, which is a fungal disease in North American bats and is probably going to make several of the species extinct soon, um, that, has, that has a virus in it and that virus is a mutualist of the fungus. It's probably responsible for causing the disease, hmm. uh, but, but so it's still, you know, not considered a good thing because it doesn't benefit the bats, but it's, it benefits the fungus. So 
You know, it's a little tricky. I, in my book, if you're going to be a mutualist, you have to be mutualistic to the host you're infecting. Mm -hmm. um, and whatever happens down the line is something else. Hmm. Hmm. Super so, interesting. so actually the story with the, the white nose syndrome is just, I just published that. In fact, it's probably hmm. just out in the e version on M sphere right now. Um, hmm. But the virus increases sporulation. We knew that before, but it, so it, it has allowed the fungus to spread, but it also increases the invasion of, of the tissue. Hmm. Hmm. Super interesting. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I think any of these stories, like, you know, I think it's kind of mutualism and antagonism in all of these ecological entanglements. I mean, the going back to the caterpillar wasp story, you know, if, if you're a plant and um, happen to dislike caterpillars because they eat your leaves, um, you know, these, these parasitoid wasps that are able to evade the immune system of the caterpillars with the help of the virus, like that's, that, that unseen viral companion becomes your friend. Yep, that's right. So it's, it's very, that's the whole problem, right? We're all one big happy family of life forms on earth. And so it's, <laughs> it's very hard to define these relationships in a strict way because yeah, exactly. What's good for one level of that holobiont is not so good maybe for the next level and vice versa. To, to bring in some more of our, our, our theory, so, you know, um, I was trained by Donna Haraway, who is a, a, a biologist who became kind of a historian of science and cultural theorist, and one of her ideas is companion species, so species that kind of eat together at the same table or, or become messmates, where um, uh -huh. they might eat each other <laughs> and partially digest each other, and um, she's, she uses the idea of indigestion to think about the uneasy getting alongness um, in, in these, these milieus where you might have, um, you know, cooperative behavior, but sometimes, you know, dyspeptic uh, elements and, and things that don't quite get along with, with the, the rest of the companions. And that's, that's kind of the, the story of multi-species life. Yeah, I, I started reading a very old book about um, messmates and parasitism. I, I forgot what the title was now. At one time, a few years ago, I was going to write a book on, on symbiosis uh, for the, a popular press book, but it didn't actually happen. And then I met somebody who was writing my, the book I wanted to write because she contacted me and she said, I want to interview you for this book I'm writing about symbiosis. <laughs> so anyway, in the end, I did not write that book, but I had done quite a lot of preparatory reading for it. And it was very helpful for me just to thinking about those sort of big concepts and and the way people look at those things was was really helpful. Um, What's that book called? Oh, I, I don't really remember. Sorry. Or the, or the author? Uh, yeah, it's very old. It's like from the late 19th century. Oh, right. Or I meant the one, the, the person who interviewed you. Oh, OK. So that one, I can tell you that I think it's out now, but I'm not 100% sure. And it's published by Patagonia Press. Uh -huh. So Patagonia that make the, you know, clothes for outdoors, outdoor wear and stuff. They also have a, a line of popular press science books and it's from them and it's on symbiosis. Cool. So it could be found from that. That's all I, I can think of off the top of my head, but. Yeah. Yeah. So, so back to some of these other really interesting, rich examples. Could you say some more about banana streak virus? Oh, that's a bizarre story, isn't it? <laughs> so banana streak virus is a endogenous, it's a pararetrovirus. So it's usually endogenized and it's, it's in, um, let's see if I can remember all the details of this. So banana is usually, um, it's sterile. Banana is generally sterile because it's trisomic or more. Um, has multiple copies. It's the result of a hybrid, a hybridization between um, a couple different wild species. But anyway, in the wild species, there's this endogenous retrovirus called banana streak virus. And it's usually just sitting there, but it is intact, it has an intact genome. And so sometimes during crossing, um, 
between certain genotypes, you know, plants are weird because you can cross different things and get these hybrids that have multiple copies of genomes and stuff. But anyway, in banana, when you cross certain uh, genotypes, the virus will exogenize, it will come out and, and then become infectious and it's spread by mealybugs, I think it is. And um, so it can kind of move around like that, like come out of the genome and become an infectious virus. So it's quite a, and it is a pathogen in, in banana. So it's not a desirable thing. It's, it's not really ever a mutualist. It's just a, not a problem when it's endogenized. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a rather complicated story. I, I would have to, and I don't have the paper in front of me because I'm on my laptop. All my good stuff is on my desktop. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, it is. A, it's actually in my book. I wrote about the banana streak in my book as well. well. well that's so. that's a great segue. I was going to invite you just in, in the remaining five minutes or so to uh, uh, tell us more about kind of the scope of your book and um, you know what, sure. what kind of some of the key things are. And then you know once it's out, maybe we could do a, a book launch together. That would be fun. Yeah. So first of all, it's a popular press science book. It is written for everybody. You don't have to have any science background, only an interest. Um, I did not, I wrote it so that it's pretty easily understood. And it has lots of illustrations as well. So it's quite um, fun to look at too. So it's, it's essentially a you know, crash course in virology. It covers many aspects of virology, including you know, the basic molecular biology parts, but I also has, a, um, as a chapter, the first chapter is just I think it's called the depth and breadth of viruses. And it talks about how, you know, the smallest viruses are like porcine circovirus, one of the smallest known viruses compared to the really giant viruses, the, the size difference is just enormous. And also that viruses are everywhere. We're surrounded by them, we're in us, they're on us, and they're just a huge part of life. It talks about all of that. Um, there's a chapter on how viruses get in and out of the host and a lot about transmission and how different hosts have different mechanisms of transmission and vector transmission is really important for a lot of viruses. Um, there is a chapter on, on uh, immunology, so how we react and how, and I should say this covers all viruses. It's not just about human or animal viruses. It covers plant, bacterial, fungal. It's got the whole nine yards there. Um, there's a chapter on evolution, virus evolution. There's, of course, a chapter on mutualistic viruses. Um, it wouldn't be a book from me without that. And there is a chapter on how viruses are so critical to our ecosystem, especially that's a lot of forest work actually in there about how viruses are really important in balancing the carbon balance and the nitrogen balance in the oceans and and then there, the final chapter is about um, pandemics. So I um, cover in that chapter, it's a little bit, it only covers three major viruses um, as examples. So influenza virus, talking about the 1918 influenza in particular, and then citrus trastasia virus, which is a plant pandemic virus still ongoing infections with that, but it's estimated to have killed about 500 million citrus trees. And then of course, coronavirus, SARS, SARS-CoV-2. I couldn't have written the book without including that. So that's in there too. Um, yeah, so that's in a nutshell, that's the book. Sounds sounds like a really important resource. I, I can't wait to uh, to have you back, and um, it's been a real delight to have this conversation. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled to be in in dialogue. And uh, again, um, this is a fabulous paper that everyone can already go out and read before the book is out. It's called "Move Over Bacteria: Viruses Make Their Mark as Mutualistic Microbial Symbionts." And uh, let's see, where did we get this from? Is it the Journal of Virology? Is that right? Yeah, yes, it's the Journal of Virology. And it's only a few pages long, so it's a quick read. Yeah, quick read, <laughs> essential if you're trying to understand um, you know, viruses and, and what role they play in, in, in the world. 
Um, so so thank, thank you again, Marilyn. And um, yeah, come back anytime. You're, you're welcome. And uh, yeah, hope, hope to see you in a Zoom room soon or in real life. Great. Thank you. This was fun. Um, good luck and good luck in Oxford. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, please, please come back. We'll, we'll add you to the to the mailing mailing list so you can come back. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's good. All right. Bye. Good to see everyone. Bye. Thank you.